I figured we'd end this chapter with a cool concept review problem taken from my student's problem set. You have a solution of 100 milliliters of this concentration of KOH and mix it with a solution of 200 milliliters of this concentration of nickel sulfate. Wow. I want you to write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction that occurs, then tell me what precipitate forms. Next, what is the limiting reactant? And last, how many grams of that precipitate form? Now, I invite you to pause the video here, attempt this on your own first, or as much as you can, then hit play, upon which I will show you how to do it on the board. This problem really combines a lot of different things in one, okay? So it starts out by saying that we're reacting KOH with nickel sulfate. So what I'd like to do is begin by trying to write down a chemical reaction equation for that. So I'm gonna write down KOH, just initially, and then I'm gonna to add to it nickel sulfate, the formula that it provided in the question, okay? Now in order to sort of track where things go, I need to figure out what the products are gonna be. And this hopefully should be pretty straightforward from what we've learned in this chapter and the preceding chapter as being a double displacement or metathesis reaction. I've got a K stuck to an OH, and then separately I have a nickel stuck to a sulfate. Sulfate's a polyatomic anion I require my students to memorize. So what's gonna happen here is they're gonna do a partner swap. So the nickel is gonna go together with the OH. So I'm going to initially just write down nickel OH, and I do not bring along any subscripts where applicable when I move it over to the right. Separately, K is gonna go together with the sulfate. So I'm gonna write down plus K sulfate, okay? Now I'm not done yet. I now need to analyze these and determine if any subscripts are required. In order to do that, I have to identify the charges of these things, okay? Now potassium is easy because it's in column one of the periodic table, which means it's gonna always have a charge of plus one. So I'll make note of that, plus one. And this is not a redox reaction, so charges don't change. Hydroxide as a whole, and I'm gonna just treat hydroxide as one thing rather than viewing it as an oxygen and a hydrogen. I do have to view it that way when we're dealing with redox chemistry, but that's not what this is. This is a double displacement metathesis reaction. So I can just treat OH as one thing, okay, one unit. OH as a whole is one of those polyatomics I require you to memorize my students. So it has a charge as a whole collectively as negative of negative one. So I'm gonna write down a negative one and make note of that. Sulfate is similar, one of those polyatomics I require my students to memorize as being negative two as a whole, as a whole lump, okay? Now, when I talk about not bringing subscripts over to the right, by the way, I'm not talking about subscripts in polyatomics, okay? SO4 has a four as part of it. I don't even consider that four to be a subscript as far as bookkeeping goes, okay? So I'm gonna bring over the charges. What about nickel? Well, nickel is one of those elements that's in the D block, which means that it can potentially exist having different charges. So what charge does it have in this particular case? Well, because it gives me this form of nickel sulfate and I've got a one-to-one -one nickel for each sulfate, the charge of the nickel must be the same as the charge for the sulfate. It must be plus two, okay? Because otherwise it would have a different number of subscripts of nickels per sulfate. So it's gonna have a plus two over here as well. Does that make sense? And I guess, you know, to keep along with tradition, I'm gonna write the plus two or the charges, I guess, above these keep things uh, you know, kind of organized a little more nicely there, okay? So I've now brought the charges over. Now, that's important because now I can see if I need subscripts. You'll notice, for example, that because the nickel and the hydroxide have different charges from each other, they're not gonna go together one to one. I have to have subscripts, and the same is true of the potassium and the sulfate. So how do I identify the charges or the subscripts, I should say? I take the charge and bring it down as a subscript for each uh, opposite Ion. So the one here, or the negative one comes down here, it shaves off its sign, just becomes a one. We don't write down ones as subscripts, they're always implied, so we just leave them alone. The two, however, will come down here. And I write it down as a subscript. Now because OH is a polyatomic, I have to write a set of parentheses around it, okay? So that I'm indicating that there is a, are two, not just of the H, but of the entire thing collectively, OH, all right? Similar thing over here, I bring the two down here in front of the potassium, <laughs> the potassium. I sometimes like to call it potassium because it has a letter A there. <laughs> so I'll write down a two right there. And then this one I can bring down as a subscript next to the SO4. I don't really have to add it. I could, if I wanted to, imagine parentheses wrapping around the SO4 and then having one subscript beneath them. But a one I don't have to worry about adding because those are you know, kind of implied, okay? Now in order to keep things a little bit more organized, I'm gonna erase all of the charges here because we now have a beautiful equation. It tells us that we have 100 milliliters of KOH that's I guess at a certain concentration of 0.200 molar or moles per liter, okay? And we're combining it with 200.0 milliliters of nickel sulfate, 
and the nickel sulfate's concentration is 0 0.150 molar or moles per liter. It then asks us a variety of different questions, okay? Now, the first question is to write the balanced chemical equation of the reaction that occurs. We've already started out doing that, and we did that by identifying the uh, subscripts that needed to go, but it isn't quite balanced yet. Now, remember, once you identify the subscripts, and the subscripts we had to identify by bringing charges over and then making sure that we brought the charges down so that charges cancel each other out, okay? Now we can bounce the equation. Now remember, once the subscripts are laid down, you cannot change them. When you bounce the chemical equation, you can only add coefficients, which are the big numbers to the left of each formula. You cannot change the subscripts, OK? So how would we balance this? Well, I've got 1k on the left side of the equation, and I've got 1k on the right. Or I've got 2k's on the right, too. So to balance that, I'm going to add a 2 coefficient right there. Now my k's are balanced. My OHs, now that I've added that 2, it multiplies through, so I have two OHs. Do I have two OHs on the right? Yes, I do, because I've got parentheses wrapped around the OH with a 2. So those are bounds. I have one nickel on the left, one nickel on the right. I have one total sulfate on the uh, left. I have one total sulfate on the right. So that is now balanced. So that is the answer to part A. Now, part B says, what precipitate forms? In order to do that, we have to use the solubility table to determine which of these is soluble in water, which ones are not, OK? So here's the solubility table. We're going to start out with our KOH. You'll notice on the solubility table that OHs are on the bottom section of the solubility table, which are the insolubles. Those are the precipitates. So it says that all OHs are insoluble except for Compounds that contain NH4, so if you have ammonium, NH4OH, that is water soluble, as well as column one metals, calcium, strontium, and barium. Now, is potassium, the letter K symbol, in column one of the periodic table? It is, which means that all OHs are insoluble except for these exceptions, and potassium is one of them. So, potassium OH, potassium OH, KOH, is soluble, so we write a Q next to it. And I I kind of didn't leave myself very much room, so I'm going to write an AQ kind of floating above it there, OK? What about nickel sulfate? Let's look at our solubility table. Sulfates are in the top half of the solubility table, which are the solubles. Compounds containing sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, are soluble except for strontium, barium, mercury, and lead. Is nickel one of those exceptions? The answer is no. Therefore, nickel sulfate is also water soluble. So we'll write AQ next to it, right? Now let's go to our products, nickel hydroxide. Again, we go to the solubility table. Hydroxides are in the bottom half, the insolubles. All hydroxides are insoluble except for NH4 hydroxide, that's ammonium hydroxide, column one metal hydroxides, calcium, strontium, and barium. Is nickel any of these exceptions? The answer is no. Therefore, knowing that all hydroxides are insoluble except for these exceptions, and nickel is not one of these exceptions, means that nickel hydroxide is not insoluble. And for the not insoluble things, we write the letter S, which stands for solid precipitate. OK, so nickel hydroxide goes into solution. It, 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 it doesn't dissolve. It stays as a solid precipitate. What about potassium sulfate? Again, we go to the solubility table top half. Sulfate's right here. All sulfates are soluble except for strontium, barium, mercury, and lead. Is potassium one of those exceptions? The answer is no. It's the letter K. It's not strontium, barium, mercury, or lead. So it is not an exception. Therefore, it is soluble. So we write AQ next to potassium sulfate, OK? We're now done with that part of the question. Again, part B of the question asked us to identify the precipitate. The precipitate is the thing that is solid, that has the letter S on the product side. And that is going to be this thing right here. So that is the answer to part B. Now we get to the tricky thing. Letter C asks, what is a limiting reactant? Well, for the limiting reactant, you might remember me talking about in our limiting reactant yield questions uh, or videos that are linked to in the description below, that in order to identify a limiting reactant, you have to go through the acronym BICPA, where letter B stands for balance the chemical equation. Now, conveniently, we've already done that. We did that in parts A and B. The letter C stands for convert to moles. We are not given these things in moles. We're given them in milliliters and concentrations. Now, to help things, uh, you know, move things along, I'm going to replace the letter M, which is molarity, with moles per liter, because that's what molarity is. And I discussed that in an earlier video, also linked to in the description below. So moles per liter, that's what the letter M is. So I need to convert each of these into moles. And it's going to be no different, even though we're dealing with 
milliliter volumes and concentrations than we would with grams. The letter C in BICPA still holds if I'm asked to identify a limiting reactant and hopefully or presumably possibly a yield from it, okay? So we start with letter B, which is balance the chemical equation, and then we go to the letter C, which is convert to moles. So I'm gonna use these values to convert them to moles. Starting with the KOH, okay? So for the KOH, I've got 100 milliliters. Now, this molarity doesn't have milliliters in it. It has liters. So I'm gonna have to convert my milliliters into liters by using dimensional analysis to put milliliters in the denominator to cancel out these milliliters, liters in the numerator, okay? Mills cancel each other out. Now I can put down liters in the denominator here to cancel out liters in the numerator here. Do I have moles per liter up here for this KOH? The answer is yes, moles of KOH, okay? So one liter of this particular solution of KOH contains 0 0.200 moles. So I'm gonna write 0 0.200 moles, a little bit diagonal because I ran out of room, okay? My liters cancel each other out. Now I need to put numbers in here. How many milliliters are there in a liter? Well, liters are big, you've held the liter bottle, milliliters are tiny. There's a thousand of these in one of these, all right? So I'm gonna put one liter has 1,000 milliliters, okay? Now I plug and chug on the calculator and I eventually convert this into moles of KOH. And it comes out to be 0 0.02 moles of KOH, right? So we're still working on this letter C, convert to moles. We've converted our KOH to moles, but we need to convert our nickel sulfate to moles. So I'll do the same thing here. So for my nickel sulfate, I'm given 200.0 milliliters. Same kind of process, I'm gonna cancel out the milliliters here by putting milliliters in the denominator, liters in the numerator, okay? One liter contains 1,000 milliliters, okay? Now I need to eventually get to moles. I can put another set of parentheses, liters in the denominator. And for this particular solution, nickel sulfate, I have 0 0.150 moles of nickel sulfate in one liter. My liters cancel each other out, my milliliters cancel each other out. I multiply all of that through, and you'll find out that this volume, 200 milliliters of this specific concentration of nickel sulfate, contains 0.03 moles of nickel sulfate. Isn't that great? So we've now done the letter C, convert to moles. What I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this volume and erase all this work and just replace these volumes and concentrations with moles because once I got everything in moles, I don't really care about the volumes anymore because everything as far as yield and amount and limiting reactant and everything will come from the moles. The letter P in BICPA stands for pick one. And again, why are we doing BICPA? The reason is because it asks us to identify the limiting reactant, okay? So we're gonna pick one. And when I say pick one, I mean pick one of the reactants. It doesn't matter which, which one you pick. Once you go through the two A's, you'll, it'll, it doesn't matter which one you pick. It'll ultimately get you to the same ultimate answer, okay? So for the sake of fun, let's go ahead and just pick the KOH, okay? You could have picked the nickel sulfate instead. So we're gonna pick the KOH. Now we move on to the letter A, the first A in BICPA, which stands for Answer the question. If I have 0.02 moles of KOH, how many moles of the other thing, nickel sulfate, do I need? So we're gonna have to figure that out by writing down moles of KOH in the denominator to cancel out my moles of KOH in the numerator here. Is it possible to directly relate moles of KOH to mickle, or to moles of nickel sulfate? Moles of mickle, yeah, see, I'm kinda messing up here. Is it possible to directly relate moles of KOH to moles of nickel sulfate. In other words, can moles of one thing and moles of another thing touch? The answer is yes, yes they can. So I'll write down moles of nickel sulfate here. Now, what numbers go in here? Yeah, they're the coefficients in the balanced equation. I have a two here, a one here, a one here, and a one there, okay? So those coefficients serve that purpose. They are a mole to mole to mole to mole ratio. So there are two moles of KOH for every one mole of nickel sulfate. What that means is that if I ran this reaction with 0.02 moles of KOH, I would need 0.01 moles of nickel sulfate. That is the first A in BICPA. Now I go to the second A. Do I have at least 0.01 moles of nickel sulfate in this scenario? The answer is yes, I've got 0.03 moles of nickel sulfate. I have extra nickel sulfate, which means nickel sulfate is added in excess here. I have extra nickel sulfate, and KOH is the one that runs out first. So KOH is the limiting reactant, and that is the answer to part C. Part D asks, how many grams of the precipitate form? Now, which one's the precipitate? Oh, it's this one right here. So I have to do some stuff in order to get to grams of this thingy, nickel hydroxide. What am I gonna do that from? 
Well, I have to do it from the limiting reactant. Remember, once you know the limiting reactant, and by the way, we did the second A in the letter or in BICPO when we you know, did this part. Anyway, once we identify the limiting reactant, everything from the product is determined from the limiting reactant, okay? So I want to get to grams of nickel hydroxide. We're going to start from moles of KOH because that is the limiting reactant. Once I know that, I don't care about the nickel sulfate, really. So write down 0 0.02 moles of KOH, and I want to eventually get to grams of nickel hydroxide. In the denominator here, I'll put the same units as in the numerator of the previous term, moles of KOH. Can I directly relate moles of KOH to moles of nickel hydroxide? The answer is absolutely, because moles and moles can always touch, <laughs> meaning they can always go in the same set of parentheses. So I've got moles of nickel hydroxide in the numerator. And the question did not ask how many moles of the precipitate do you form, it asked how many grams. So I have to lay down another set of parentheses. The units in the denominator here are going to be the same as the units in the numerator of the previous term. In other words, it's going to be moles of nickel hydroxide. Now the question asked us to get to grams of precipitate, and we know that the precipitate is nickel hydroxide because that's the one that is solid, insoluble according to our solubility rules. Can you directly relate moles of one thing to grams of the same thing? The answer is yes, I can directly relate moles of this thing to grams of this thing. How do I do that? By using the molecular or formula weight. We'll get to that in just a minute. For now, what numbers do I put in here? Yeah, these are again the coefficients in front of their respective locations the bounce chemical equation. So the coefficient in front of the KOH is two. So we'll put a two right there. The coefficient in front of the nickel hydroxide is an implied one. So I'll put that there. Now, how many grams of nickel hydroxide are there in one mole of nickel hydroxide? For that, I have to go to the periodic table and figure out what the atomic weight is of nickel. And I did that earlier. It is 59, and I'm rounding to keep it easy. This formula has two oxygen atoms in it because there's parentheses wrapped around the OH, and there's a number two out here. Each oxygen weighs 16, okay? So I have to do 16 times two, okay? So I'm gonna kind of take my 59 plus 16 times two, and I'm gonna add to that, I've got two hydrogens. Each hydrogen weighs one. So I'm gonna take one times two. So I've got 59 plus 16 times two is 32. So 59 plus 32, plus one times two is two. So 59 plus 32 plus two all comes out to 93 grams. So the molecular weight for nickel hydroxide is 93 grams. So what you do is multiply this stuff out. In other words, I'm gonna take 0 0.02, divide it by two, get an answer. Then I'm gonna take that answer, multiply it by 93, and I'll get my final answer in units of grams of nickel hydroxide. I hope that was as fun for you as it was for me.